the largest message, not the largest, but one of the messages I like to send here is it's about networks. And so I think we need to be equipping these students and encouraging them to build their networks. And these affinity groups are one way to start that. Because when there are only a couple of us screaming, our voices are very muted. And so I think my response to that would be, yes, I agree with you. Because there is no particular group that these students fit in. Um, but they really have to come together and use their networks to create, be the, be the start. They have to be the start Always of the change. Always amazes me how when we talk about coming together and bringing quote unquote diversity together, that when it comes to sports teams, we have no problems with that. We got no problems to say, hey, you know that black guy there? That's the best player on that team. And if he does what he does, and that Hispanic does what he does, and that white American does what he does, we're going to have a winning team. And that's what we want, a winning team. So I'm saying, how come that doesn't work in the larger society? So it's important that we develop the skills that allow us to be critical thinkers, critical actors, and to raise those kinds of critical questions to bring about social change. And it seems to me we're in the best position to do that, those of us who are in the classroom. Not that we're trying to get people to believe what I believe, but to give them the skills so they can assess for themselves and draw their own conclusions. One of the things that I, that I find with a lot of students is they don't understand how to go about getting evidence and assessing that evidence in order to test assumptions and theories. And we need to when give them that. engage in conversation as opposed to just a one-way uh, interaction, uh, you are giving them permission to be wrong, which mm -hmm. is a critical part of the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're giving them permission to explore ideas and view this as a transition point, as opposed to uh, a point of contact test of their validity. Uh, and so, you know, when, when you, especially the Socratic method that you're describing, you know, can you give me more information? Can you, you know, you're just always asking these questions. It's empowering to the student to have the freedom to be wrong, especially in interaction with a uh, figure of authority. Uh, to have the possibility of being right when the figure of authority may be misguided, and to recognize that on this level, you're welcome as equal partners in this meaning making, you know, that, that the meaning making is collected. So uh, I think that that's part of the critical uh, oh, nature of this approach. Where are the solidly black middle class neighborhoods? And when I say that, I mean in the same way we think about solidly middle class white neighborhoods, those neighborhoods with the entire package good schools, uh, middle class longevity. There are, in my opinion, and I'm not a residential scholar, so I don't know, I may be wrong, but in my opinion, I don't feel like that there are any of those pockets, for example, of black middle class neighborhoods. Okay, my, my sense, so I primarily look at uh, the dissimilarity index, uh, you know, at, at the block level, and so I'm much more familiar with the neighborhoods that are right, racially integrated. Mm -hmm. But I would say that there, um, North Avondale, which is racially integrated but is majority African American, it's middle class, it's been stable for decades, um, has a very strong neighborhood association that has worked very diligently since it was founded in about 1960. There's Kennedy Heights, which is out on the northeast corner of, of the city, which is also majority black, um, solidly middle class, both black and white, also has a very active community council.